With one of Hollywood's largest ensemble casts ever, the 2010 romantic holiday film Valentine's Day was boundary breaking in many ways. In fact, most of the characters seem to have no boundaries whatsoever. If a stranger interacted with me using even one tenth of the crazed enthusiasm that Ashton Kutcher shows in this thing, I would think I was being mugged and throw my wallet in the other direction. Although the character stories are a little more carefully intertwined in Valentine's Day than in its follow up New Year's Eve, that didn't stop the other dismal aspects of this movie from entering my body through the nose and then squirming their way south to become bowel obstructions. And I'm passing those harmful blockages onto you in the form of heteronormative cliches instead of actual characters, dated references instead of actual comedy, and a two hour slog through over romanticized LA traffic instead of a movie worth caring about. So stick a February 14th fork in me because I'm all already done with this new seasonal installation of Clip Breakdown. Wah! Today's Clip Breakdown is sponsored by Babbel, which is the number one way for me to learn a new language all on my phone. I have a planned trip to Mexico in October and I would really like to be conversational in Spanish by the time that I get there. I feel like learning a new language is a great way for me to continue with self-improvement in the new year. And Babbel teaches you practical, real-world conversations. I'm taking a travel essentials course in there right now. The curriculum is designed by real teachers, not machines or artificial intelligence, which is why I already know how to say things like donde esta la farmacia or me duele la cabeza. These are the things you need to know on vacation because you never know. This award-winning technology is brought to you in the form of short 10-minute lessons, so I'm able to catch up and continue learning really fast, and this is proven to help you start speaking within three weeks. I also love that there are multiple ways to learn, such as podcasts and games even live classes with top teachers. And there's a 20 day money back guarantee. Start speaking a new language in three weeks with Babbel. Get up to 65% off by clicking the link in my description below. Again, I think this is a great way for me to keep up with my self-improvement goals for the new year. Be sure to check it out. Now on to today's breakdown. Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other such content on the web, and we pluck it apart like the petals on a forget-me-not to say, he loves this part, he hates this one. How did she win an Oscar? How is he still alive? Those are the questions that come up in this review of Valentine's Day, another Gary Marshall original. For those who don't know, Gary Marshall was the director of films like Pretty Woman, The Princess Diaries, and now this one. But before we get into it, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up. Don't forget to click subscribe subscribe for two new videos every week. You can kind of tell right off the bat that this movie is mm, a sign of the times, a product of its era. Today is Valentine's Day. Say hey. That's right, everybody. Like all Gary Marshall movies, Valentine's Day also serves as a love letter to the city it takes place in. So we're back in this sugar-coated version of Los Angeles, where classism is cute and the supporting characters have funny foreign accents. We got a taste for all of this back in 1990's Pretty Woman, the movie about an emotionally stunted businessman grooming a sex worker into somebody that he deems capable of taking to a restaurant. When I first saw that movie, I was like, people think this is cute? What in the 50 shades of financial domination? But don't worry, there's still plenty of veiled misogyny in all of these little intertwining storylines, which is a screenwriting technique used to make sure we all experience a myriad of little heterosexual situations. Also, shout out to the song Say Hey, I Love You by Michael Franti. It's fitting that both this movie and its opening song remind us that art can be both financially successful and wildly forgettable at the same time. Let's dive into our first story starring someone who was not New Year's Eve, Ashton Kutcher. Back then, he was a New York comic book artist getting lucky with Leah Michelle in an elevator. Here, he's some who sells flowers who I want to drown. He said, if you ever are with a girl that's too good for you, marry her. 
oh, so your ex-girlfriend just wasn't good enough for you. That's a weird way to interpret her passing away, but whatever, it's your life, Ashton. Also, I got overly excited about this non-committal New York accent you're trying out because it sadly disappears after this line of dialogue. Sadly, but wisely. Good choice on your part. So Ashton's character here, again, with these movies, I'm not learning the names of the characters. Why would I? There's 50, there's 60, there's 70 characters. So he's a flower delivery guy with George Lopez. This is his florist place that he owns. I could be a sappy cheese ball all day and no one will think I'm a moron. And everyone is romantic on Valentine's Day. Even people who shouldn't be, such as teens, children, and babies, as this movie will continue to show us through countless gender binary vignettes. The white cishet director cleverly uses these inserts to remind the audience that societal constructs are there for a reason, and racial stereotypes are just harmless fun. And most importantly, they can help make your shitty movie even longer. So Ashton Kutcher just proposed to Jessica Biel. She did say yes, but automatically, all of the people he tells in his life seem to be surprised that she said yes. Doesn't matter though, let's flash over to the TV studio for Jamie Foxx. There's only one story today, Calvin. What does Valentine's Day mean to you? You're right, F that car bombing that just happened in Yemen. Stop the presses, we need 24 hour coverage of this writing prompt you would give a kindergartner. Kathy Bates, get out of this movie. I need happy, I need romantic, I need love, and I need it from you. Nice try, Jamie Foxx, but whispering your lines quietly won't fool me into thinking that you're in this movie less. Now earn that paycheck and say it with your whole chest so that the people watching this movie who aren't very active listeners will chuckle at what they consider a punchline. This movie throws out so much outdated social media slang that it just tried to poke me on Facebook. <laughs> That's how people in the audience laughed at Jamie Foxx saying, you need Jesus. Like, it's not even a joke. It's not even a joke. It's just a thing he said. It doesn't even make sense with what she said. Okay, you just fully interrupted that woman's conversation with a ghost while also touching her lower back without permission. Run, lady! That's how men try to mark you for sex later! I happen to like that, though. If a man touches my lower back while flirting with me, I will naturally water birth his child on the spot, right within my urine-soaked dungarees. If I were her, I'd be like, what about your lucky bamboo, you f***ing pig? Uh. Again, Ashton is everyone's favorite flower f***er. Morley said yes. She said yes? What? What did she say? Everybody? Yes, she said yes. I'm getting married. Nice. Great news. He said, you there, pick up those flowers that are right in front of you and carry them off screen. They're wrapping up the Asian representation for this movie. The blocking in these movies is so mindless. It feels like we're not even supposed to be watching what the actors are doing. Gary Marshall was on set like, why would I give a f what the actors are holding in their hands. Can we just get more fresh flowers in every corner of this room? Thank you. I need to get her something like really nice though, like out of the ordinary, you know? What is it? No, 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 no. Do not open until perfect moment. Why though? He's not trying to surprise himself with the gift to his fiance. The movie doesn't even try to explain why this particular flower is the briefcase from Pulp Fiction. It's just a superficial cliffhanger meant to extend your will to live through to the end of the movie. Doesn't seem to work though. I have a feeling this movie is what causes all of those dogs to jump off a bridge in Scotland. Group psychosis, mama. Do not play this movie at a party or it will be Lord of the Flies up on your lazy boy furniture. Also, why does Ashton or open the box like that. He's like, oh, a flower for me? It's like, that's not how you'd open it. I hate this. The Captain and Neil were married on talking? Valentine's Day. What's he oh, talking about? 110 million red roses are sold in America every Valentine's Day. Wow, thanks for jumping in with those white savior facts about flowers. He gave that friend of his, Olive, one sentence to talk before he pushes him off camera and is like, excuse me, uh, roses are red, violets are blue. I call my erection lucky bamboo. And Jamie Foxx is behind the camera like, keep rolling, this guy knows his stuff. I guess that Ashton Kutcher being on the news creates like a uh, even busier time for the florist shop that he owns because he's able to plug it, which to me is like literally, he stole it from Simon Pham's flowers. Like, I don't know the flower biz. Sienna bouquet. Sienna bouquet. In that, off of Ventura. That 
racist Asian stereotype is some of the most subtle writing in this whole script. And that's only because they didn't make either of them say anything. Hollywood was like, what prejudice? What bias? Anyway, that's a wrap on the Asian flower market family. If we can get back to shooting our A through D storylines about white lady McPaleskin. Do you guys remember when Patrick Dempsey was the star? There was a period during my puberty where I thought Patrick Dempsey was the ultimate looker. Now I'm looking and I'm like, mm, just basic, very basic. When I'm fixing his heart, you. Oh, thank you. Listen, I love getting a low cost holiday gift from my married boyfriends, but if you find yourself shopping that seasonal aisle at Walgreens on my behalf, you can skip the cheesy hard goods and just turn yourself around to face that shelf of value sized bagged candy. Get a bag of heart shaped Reese's meant for an entire classroom and pour it all over my body. That will cause me to once again, give birth to a child in my own juices. Sorry you keep unknowingly triggering me to describe that process in such a visual way too. P.S. I just spoiled it, but Jennifer Gardner doesn't know that heart surgeon Patrick Dempsey is married yet. I also love these movies because they're like, people know you for playing a doctor on TV, so we're gonna go ahead and have you play a doctor in the movies as well. Not trying to shake the foundation of people's f***ing cognitive makeup here. So McDreamy is all like, oh, I'll be out of town for Valentine's Day, but you have your friend's anti-Valentine's Day thing to go to tonight. You know my friend Kara, she throws this annual I hate Valentine's Day dinner. What's there to hate? For the rest of us single women, it's kind of a giant cosmic bitch slap. Jennifer Gardner's agent said, listen, my client doesn't do nudity, but for another half million, she is willing to air a fart out of her nightgown and briefly flash those thong panties. That's right, Jenny G keeps it and classy here, hashtag Princess Diana. While she's in the bathroom, Ashton comes on TV and we see like, okay, his little news interview is gonna stupidly intertwine people's <laughs> too. <laughs> Love is the only shocking act left on the planet. Uh, I have an aluminum dildo jumper cabled to a car battery that would beg to differ. Okay, fine, but what he said was gross too. Love is the most shocking act left on the planet. Love itself is not even an act, it's an emotion. So your theory kind of falls apart at the sentence structure level, you dumb sh I'm swearing too much on this. It's gonna be like beep, beep, beep. That's okay, this isn't television, it's you internet tubes. YouTube is on the internet for free. Oh my God, more people, more dumb people. Did you get my good side? I don't know, roll over. Oh. <laughs> okay, Cackles the Clown, I think you just put your knee through his sternum. This feels like a very forced recreation of a, a more successful Gary Marshall improvised moment. Apparently the 2010s version of that would be swiping a woman's legs out from under her at the knee while she's not wearing any underwear. Lovely. So this is Anne Hathaway and Topher Grace's stories. They are 20 somethings in love, just trying to make it happen in LA. There is fresh coffee for you in the kitchen. I think I'm out of coffee. Yeah, you were, but I borrowed some from your neighbor. By the way, she was very surprised that you had female company. She thought that you were gay. Don't worry. Okay, this girl is clearly a lot. First of all, don't go knocking on my neighbor's doors while I'm asleep asking for coffee and starting conversations about how gay I seem. It's a real problem if your pick me energy is actually waking up people next door. Plus more brainless dialogue. She says there's fresh coffee in the kitchen and he says, I think I'm out of coffee. Oh, then that must be phantom liquid from another dimension that she's referencing in the kitchen, you dummy. And how did she prove to the neighbor that Doogie Hauser here is and gay. Reveal those paper thin prison commissary boxers that he's wearing. This whole subplot making me sick. Okay, so she goes outside and she takes a phone call and we get this reveal. My roommate just got home. Do you wanna have a threesome? If he says yes, it'll take me a minute to change. Why do you need to change outfits for a threesome? Or is she talking about tampons? If so, don't even worry about it. Red wedding mama. Also, this woman is clearly shown to be a stranger. So I don't know why she suddenly thinks she's the roommate Anne Hathaway's talking about. Like, come on, Margaret, you went to dry bar three days ago and your inner freak still has not gone back to bed. Hector Elizondo is in this movie as in all Gary Marshall movies. Once again, playing the grandfather we should all assume aspire to be, helping his son, grandson Edison, who seems to be sadly making Valentine's Day cards, even though, you know, that's something him, him and his mother used to do together. So we don't know where the mom is. Presumed dead, snipered, snipered on the streets. <laughs> I can't eat, Grandpa. Are you sick? Hmm? Yeah. 
love sick. All right, well, some kids can't make healthy bone marrow on their own, so shut up now. If there's one thing I can't stand, it's the precocious kid who's in love trope that movies are always pulling out. Can't we just let children try to survive the first 10 years of their lives before we start obligating them to make grand romantic gestures if they're boys and to try to be small, shy, commercially attractive young women if they're girls? Conservatives are afraid teaching queer histories in school is going to mess with their kids' minds, but then they think it's normal and healthy to dress their babies up as bride and groom and make them kiss each other as infants. I'm not the pervert, straight people are the pervert. Go f yourself. Okay, I hope you guys are ready because if you and all of your fifth grade friends skip school to see this part of the movie, it's time to stand up and cheer. Oh boy, oh. Hi. Hi. I can actually feel the editor holding for applause when Taylor Swift's face gets revealed. This movie spends more time catering to its built-in audience of Tay-Tay stands, to the point where it becomes obvious that those children were all that was required to make back the budget that was needed to pay for this ensemble cast of A-listers. This is Taylor Swift's like only live action movie role. She did this one in the Lorax. I wonder why she hasn't acted in more. <laughs> and But you know, I look outside my door and my boyfriend's nowhere to be found. But there's like this giant white Bear. Yeah, the bear's there. <laughs> On the ground. Oh, he's a cat. Yeah. Isn't that like the sweetest thing ever? This attempt at playing a character? Yes, that's so cute. Like you're hosting SNL or doing a skit at Girl Scout camp. I can't tell if this movie is just making its one millionth reference to something better, or if they just put Jennifer Gardner in an elevator with some young girl to trick me into thinking this is 13 going on 30 when I'm channel surfing past E. We briefly uh, see up in an airplane, Bradley Cooper is sitting there and some flight attendant puts a blanket over him and Julia Roberts, who has army fatigues on and is sleeping on his shoulder. So it's kind of assumed they're together. Oh, and if you're wondering how this movie ballooned to two hours long, it's because of stuff like this. Gary Marshall loves to put in little scenes that remind us it takes a village to raise a child and everyone, even strangers, are always in it for the best of us. Yes, uh, you can't put the baby on the counter. It's oh, very dangerous. It should be oh, off the counter. Oh. Here, let me hold her. You should know we're Jewish. God loves us all. Why would you even feel the need to say that, lady? Do you think these nuns are gonna stigmata all over the petunias when they touch your Jewish baby's flesh? Also, I love that they dubbed in that nun's dialogue to sound like Reagan from The Exorcist. God loves us all. Filmmakers love to make the extras remain bizarrely silent on set in unnatural situations. And then they just have one person like ADR in some out of place lines in post. It saves on like Screen Actors Guild fees, but it's just like always so distracting to me. Jennifer Gardner's character comes to the shop. She's friends with Ashton Kutcher. She's also surprised that his fiance said yes. But she's like describing how she's sad that her boy Boyfriend Patrick Dempsey is away in San Francisco for Valentine's Day, supposedly to do heart surgery. So Ashton Kutcher, a hopeless romantic, is like, oh, you should fly out and surprise him. And she's like, I don't know, should I? It's not Valentine's Day, you don't think. You just do. Go. I'm all. I know it sounds crazy, but I just can't get into watching these two babies kiss. And it does not help that if you look closely, both of them are covered in chocolate and have donut holes in their mouth from the craft service table. Excuse me, can one of their mothers squirt some breast milk into their mouths before the next take? We're getting a lot of crumbs visible on the HD monitor. Those kids pressing their open mouths together is truly the worst thing I've ever seen. When Jennifer gets on the phone with her boyfriend, we get the reveal of what his double life is like. Hello there. Hi. Girl, you gotta stop paying for empty cups of coffee. It's a waste of money. And frankly, it's not fooling anyone. We know about your overactive thyroid condition. It's okay. Also, she is borderline spinning that dry looking bran muffin on her pinky like it's a basketball at a Globetrotters game. Meanwhile, McDreamy is a McLiar. Hi, Daddy. Hey, Peanut. Did you fix all the broken hearts? I did. Oh, surgery went late. I stayed at the condo. I figured, doesn't daddy juggle well? Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's like, look at these lemons, honey. This is what I'm gonna do to your later. Excuse me, sir. Your daughter was eating those citruses. Every morning she has to unhinge her jaw like a python and swallow a large bowl of unpeeled fruit or she dies of scurvy. And you would know that if you weren't always sneaking around. When Bradley and uh, Julia wake up, they start flirting or it's supposed to look like flirting. 14 hour flight both ways just for one night. You're romantic I and mean, that's, that's quite a gesture. 
You're on Facebook. I would be at that emergency door like, does anyone mind if I open this? I just want all of the air to get sucked out of the plane and kill us. Because right now, Army Captain Julia Roberts is losing it at the mere mention of Facebook, sitting on a 14 hour flight with the dust and sweat of Operation Iraqi Freedom still crusted onto her uniform. The other movie had Zac Efron talking about Facebook for no reason too. It's like, we get it. Facebook was popular once, now we hate it. In case you didn't know, people from other places are a hilarious quirk of living in a big city. <laughs> what, is, what language are you speaking? I used to speak Bulgarian, but I'm an American citizen now. Uh, does anybody here speak English with a Bulgarian accent? Oh, I do. This movie, how do you say, poisons my blood, creates a, what do you call it, pants disaster. At a certain point, you realize this director isn't so much celebrating America's melting pot as much as he's using it to create gold bars to pay Anne Hathaway and Julia Roberts appearance fees, using the stolen dental fillings from your immigrant ancestors. Grandpa is talking to Grandpa Joe and Charlie Bucket. That's who they are. <laughs> Grandpa Joe's talking to Charlie Bucket about what it feels like to be in love. This kid's like, it makes my heart go doo doo, doo doo. I'd be like, Valentine's Day heart murmur? Arr, we gotta get to the ER! Kick him out on the curb of the hospital. Help him! Drop him off at school after! I f***ing can't stand kids. If I had grandkids, matricide. Homicide. <laughs> Infanticide. Insecticide. <laughs> Pesticide. I can't. He's not allowed to say it. Guys, it's Valentine's Day. Don't talk about killing kids. Okay, here's the real truth about Valentine's Day. People think that the best seasonal candies come from Christmas, and in a way, sort of. But also, Valentine's Day. I love the conversation hearts that are not Necco wafer, but are sweet tarts. You know the ones, like Smarties, you know the ones. Anyway, little Edison just loves to buy romantic gifts for the women in his life. Ugh, I'm sorry, but I don't like this kid. I'll be there. Thank you, sir. What's up with the cutest kid in the world coming here and more <laughs> and then short of me? He's giving me like 15 bucks for $55 ration. That flower shop coworker is like, ah, 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 stop improvising with me. Ah, ah, they didn't pay for me to have any lines. Ah, oh, oh. I don't know if she means to steal every scene she's in from the background, but I'm obsessed with this lady. Look how she's holding that phone. She's like, what? It turns out this morning when Topher left, this was like not fully realized for me either. He doesn't realize till he's at his mailroom job that he forgot about Valentine's Day this morning. Having someone uh, not realize that it was Valentine's Day is a trope we've seen before to much better effect. Like if Anne Hathaway had been making more romantic gestures that morning or seemed visibly kind of bothered that they didn't have plans for that night, it would make a lot more sense when he's like, I'm such an idiot for not remembering. But she doesn't seem to care at all. She's like, I love taking pictures of you naked. Like she doesn't seem to be expecting anything and she never mentions m minding that he doesn't remember it's Valentine's Day. So never feel feels like a good conflict. In addition to being a phone sex operator, Anne Hathaway is also the assistant to Queen Latifah's character. Queen Latifah feels very forced into this. I'm Paula. I know they call me bipolar Paula. Don't. Paula, I'm sorry you felt the need to even tell me not to call my new boss that, but I should probably offer the feedback that by making it the very first thing you said when we met, I'm probably gonna remember it for the rest of my life. Thankfully, this offensive nickname never comes up again, although from a writing perspective, it probably should. Like later when Anne Hathaway gets caught talking on the phone or talking to her boyfriend, if she got caught using that nickname even just like accidentally and Paula heard it, that would be good. And Instead, it's like it doesn't even matter. Looking back, it seems like the worst of comedy in the 2010s just involved saying something that would age horribly. No punchline. You just put it out there, and then we all watch the flies come lay eggs on it. Next, we go to Eric Dane. He lives in a big mansion. He throws away a toothbrush, so it looks like he, like, I don't know, broke up with somebody. On the news, they're like, oh, he's a football player. Is he gonna retire? What's happening with him? And then there are these ladies out on the beach who are like, we love you, Eric. Queen Latifah is his manager. And then he calls Jessica Beale here, who is his publicist. Eric Dane, by the way, so hot. He's in Euphoria, I think. I got a meeting with my agent today. I want you to meet me there in about an hour. Hello? 
No, no, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. I'll, I'll, I'll be at the meeting. Um, I'm not fooled by that headband she's wearing. If my publicist had a face that pretty, she would be teleconferencing into every meeting. Thank you very much. This is about my public image, okay? So I don't need anyone from my team getting scouted for fashion week during a press apology for my televised nip slip. I swear it was not planned for me to slip on my own nipples like that. My doctors now think that it was the high humidity in Daytona, Florida while I was hosting and MTV's spring break that caused them to flop on the ground and act like cartoon banana peels. That's the reason I no longer even set foot inside the grocery store while those produce misters are on. Oh good, Emma Roberts is in it too. This is one of the more forgettable storylines too. It's like three little things and then we're out. How about today at lunch? Like normally that would work for me, but today at lunch I'm gonna have sex with my boyfriend for the first time. Wow. First time having sex for both of us. Yeah girl, you better get first time in the same movie your aunt is in. I think this character's frankness about sex is supposed to feel like feminism. Emma Roberts says, um, intercourse is perfectly natural, AKA exactly how this hair color looks on me. Since we're at the high school, let's check in with Taylor Swift and Taylor Lautner, who I believe were dating in real life at this time. So, you know, you can see how it was so gimmicky. I've ironed on your lucky number on the back. 13. <laughs> but that's your lucky number. You don't even like it. Mama, I don't even almost like it. Gary Marshall is probably like, I don't know why she keeps demanding we add dialogue about the number 13, but my granddaughters and their private school friends will buy any single thing that her face is on. And frankly, they don't have the taste level to distinguish between good and bad acting. So bring on Taylor and Taylor's intro to theater scene study. Oh my God, this 14 hour flight that Julia Roberts is on feels like I'm on a 14 hour flight. Seven in a row. It's amazing. You are like, this woman's a shark. Hey, you are good at this. Game. Not really. I know I've already said this before, and I know she didn't even say anything this time, but shut up, Gary Marshall's granddaughter. You can't say it wasn't nepotism if the director let your spring church recital count as the audition for this role. When the little kid Edison asked for flowers to be delivered to quote, the best girl at school, Ashton Kutcher was like, oh, my friend works at that school. I know right where it is. And then McDreamy comes in and uh, kind of shows his hand a little bit. Two arrangements, uh, something special along the same roses for each one of my uh, ladies. I need your discretion. We have an understanding. Yes, we understand it would have been even more discreet to just not say anything about your relationship to the people you're sending flowers to. Or at least not awkwardly call them my ladies. Or you could just go ahead and do all of this online. I'm pretty sure government officials securely sending gifts to their mistresses is 98% of the reason the army had to develop the internet. So Emma Roberts' boyfriend, who I don't know who plays him, he's waiting for Emma Roberts in her bedroom naked with his guitar when and the mom comes home, so that's a big mix up. He runs out of the house naked. Emma Roberts picks him up, so that plan is foiled. Anne Hathaway is still trying to keep her phone sex career hidden from her boyfriend. Thank you for calling Naughty Nymphos. Hi there. <laughs> Hi, honey. Just wanted to let you know that we can all hear your German BDSM phone sex from over in the elevator bank because you're speaking at full voice in a room full of cubicles. Anne might be fooling her boyfriend, but Paula knows better. You heard that? It's my phone line. Oh, Paula, I'm so sorry. Am I fired? That's cool. You got away with dirty words. I like that. Just make sure you answer my calls first. And other than that, I'm fine with just paying you to do nothing for me while running up my phone bill and risking the credibility of my business with your adult entertainment service. Why? Because I'm a fully realized and grounded supporting character, comma, black woman, parentheses, only one. The producers of this movie were like, we know it's a huge cast of stars with only like two people of color. But to be fair, we could have sworn Kathy Bates was half black back when we hired her. But now HR is telling us it was racist to even assume that based on the fact that she sometimes wears a wig. So I guess everything Hollywood says or does is racist now, huh? Yes, but also sexist and child predatorist. Also, I think child predatorist is what Jeffrey Epstein called the guests of his private island. He even ordered them custom t-shirts. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. He probably didn't do the t-shirt thing. Eric Dane gets into a car accident with the flower van, delaying some of the 
flower orders. I honestly don't think anything comes of this. Oh, oh, so that prevents Edison's flower arrangement from making it to the girl at school that he was sending flowers to, who we still don't know their identity. Ashton just found out about the double life of her boyfriend because he knew from looking at the address that, oh, Patrick Dempsey's got a secret wife that Jennifer doesn't know about. So he goes to the school to alert her. Can I need to talk to you? Do you have a second? Yeah, sure. Yes, you're in charge. Recess, let's party. Sit down and be quiet. Got that? Or what, Edison? The government will make me go live at your grandma and grandpa's house too? The filmmakers want this kid to seem so responsible and mature. I just know they're trying to manipulate me into feeling proud of my grandson. But guess what, world? I don't, and I'm never procreating him into existence because gross. The Doramio name dies with me. Unless, of course, someone with a longer life expectancy gets it tattooed on their arm. Preferably with a four-panel cartoon strip depicting how I died and who cried the most. Ashton doesn't even get a chance to tell Jennifer Gardner that she's being cheated on. Edson comes out and he's like, where are the flowers I ordered? And he's like, sorry, I don't care about this storyline. And he doesn't have a chance to tell Jennifer because she's, like, distracted. To your seat! That's it! That's it! it. I can't talk right now! Mama, you are screaming like it's your job to get these kids onto lifeboats right now, not calm them down for independent reading. She said, can't you see I'm caring for these children? Swinging little Maddox around by his ponytail. Oh, so Emma Roberts, everyone's someone in this thing. After school, she's nannying Edson, even though that basically just means driving him home to his grandparents' house. I don't know why he has a babysitter when the grandparents are clearly home all day watching him. It's also revealed that Jennifer Gardner is friends with Jessica Beale, who is on the phone freaking out because nobody has rsvp to her annual anti-valentine's day party it doesn't matter anyway jennifer gardner's like people will show up it's fine but when ashton gets home things are not fine for him and his newly agreed engagement thing i love you but i'm just not ready for this kind of commitment i didn't know that this morning Thank you so much for your honest beauty, Jessica Alba. Let's normalize saying yes to a marriage proposal and then changing your mind a little bit later. Because frankly, I tend to procrastinate on breakups and I feel pressured to say yes when I'm put on the spot. So I can fully see myself falling into this situation. So, so uh, she moves out, goodbye, Jessica Alba, loved ya. And that's when uh, George Lopez is like, I sort of had an inkling that she wasn't fully into the relationship like you were. <laughs> Keep inklings to yourself. You share them. That's what friends do. That's common knowledge. It's in the damn handbook. Sorry, Reed. You're right. Oh, he's right? Then show me that handbook of friendship that says it's a good idea to tell your bestie when you think his girlfriend doesn't want to marry him. Because I somehow doubt that that's so often the right move that they decided to put it into print. Because he didn't have a chance to dissuade Jennifer Gardner from flying to San Francisco and surprising her boyfriend, Ashton has to run to the airport. But I guess not only has he realized he needs to stop her from breaking her own heart, but he realizes that it's her that he has has loved I guess this whole time. Cause then he waxes poetic to the ticketing agent at the airport being like, her face is like sunshine. Her is a rainbow. <laughs> her hole is her she kisses. <laughs> That's nasty. And I'm just like, literally this morning you were talking about how you are the most romantic person because of Jessica Alba. And now suddenly those feelings perfectly transfer to Jennifer Gardner. Like you can't just go after whatever is, it's so unearned. Like this guy just wants to be in a relationship. Can't you just be single for one day? It's been five minutes since you broke off your engagement. Maybe you don't love her. Anyway. She's like sunshine, huh? Well, in that case, it's on me. Go on, get out of here. Thank you. <laughs> wow, he printed him the magical no name or identification required plane ticket, which is a privilege that Southwest Airlines gives to all of its employees in an effort to help the friends and family of their flight attendants escape drug charges. I just realized this guy who plays the ticketing agent is also a Gary Marshall regular. He played the stylist in uh, Princess Diaries 1 and 2. He was the tow truck guy in New Year's Eve. That's all I know. <laughs> Okay, so Ashton Kutcher runs through security to warn Jennifer Gardner, but she still gets on the plane, it would seem. Also, Julia Roberts is getting ready to land. She finally changed out of the army uniform. We still have to deal with the little kid. Get out, get out. Edison, what in the heck is wrong with you? I'm in love. So am I, but I can move my feet. 
I could have sworn when we first met this kid, he was sad about spending Valentine's Day without his mom. But then I guess he's also suddenly the kid from Love Actually who literally wants to settle down and start a family with someone. When in reality, someone that age would still have the cognitive reasoning of an adult pig. Things get a little messy here too. Jamie Foxx is at the PR agency, I guess to interview Eric Dane's character. Or that's when they help Jessica Biel who's in crisis because no one loves her and she hates Valentine's Day. They're just setting it up so that Jamie Foxx and Jessica Biel end up together. It's very, very, very uh, afterthought of a thing. But look, more Taylor Swift. So Felicia, if he's the star athlete, you are... Not the cheerleader. I'm on the dance team. Five, six, seven, eight. Okay, but the only difference between that hilarious physical comedy and the actual choreography that Taylor Swift does on tour is a glittery jumpsuit. Also, I'm guessing that introducing herself as not the cheerleader is a reference to her song, You Belong With Me. But I weirdly always remember her playing a cheerleader in this movie. Probably since she's standing in front of a bunch of cheerleaders practicing and what she's doing looks like cheerleading. I'm guessing that this was another story element that Taylor Swift wanted changed. Even even though they had already sourced a real Los Angeles cheer squad as background. Emma Roberts is talking to Edison's grandparents about how she ended up not having sex with her boy. She's just talking to everyone about that, that virgin pussy of hers, that virgin pussy. So the grandpa is like, grandma and I, we're the only people who have slept with each other our whole lives. And I'm like, ooh, cause grandma is instantly like suspiciously gets up and makes this confession. And um. You had an affair. Uh, yes. Wow, this is not the A, B, C, D, E, F storyline we asked for on Valentine's Day, but it is the one I'll be glossing over the fastest. But I guess Jennifer Gardner did not get on the plane after Ashton talked to her because then she shows up at the Los Angeles hospital for some investigation. Can I ask you a question? Is Dr. Copeland married? They just celebrated their 15th anniversary. Mr. Gardner, early seating. I am obsessed with these salon fresh nurses. With a single nod, the older, wiser one communicated, speak the truth, for the code of women requires us to tell this complete stranger where our coworker is so she can go confront him in public. It's good to know that apparently these movies take place in a time space where people are not able to purchase guns using the letterhead from their restraining order notifications as proof of ID. She's like, woman to woman, where's your boss so I can go stab him? And they're like, Maggiano's. <laughs> like, you still have to work with this guy and you just ratted him out. <laughs> okay, anyway, let's go back to Eric Dane's press conference. That's a big culmination of lots of people. Jessica Biel is there, whatever. Because of my job, I haven't been able to live the life I want to. I'm gay. Any questions? And, and be cool, because I'm not above kicking anybody's ass. You see, on Valentine's Day, the gay becomes the basher. It's a magical day where there are no rules. Left is right, up is down. Eric Dane counts as queer representation. Not only is it obviously problematic that a straight actor is playing a character whose gayness is used as an exploitative third act reveal, but you can also tell that this movie thinks it's breaking stereotypes types by showing an openly gay athlete or a gay person who is not seeming traditionally gay. But in reality, this is just more of the same. TV and movies serving us a very limited view of what gay people are actually like that also glorifies what many see as masculine character traits. Him saying that he's not above beating up journalists has the same energy as those guys who used to be like, I'm not your typical gay guy, okay? I don't like drag race or Lady Gaga, and I would rather watch a football game. Okay, well thank you very much, gay Chad. Now I know not to try and start a conversation with you after you me, so that's very helpful. I only wish Eric Dane was actually a gay football player. I'd be like, you better take that football cleat and put it up my ass, strap it on and put it up my ass. <laughs> no, I'm not retiring. I'm gay and I'm gonna play. Yay, equality! It's about time that openly gay football players also get the chance to sustain traumatic head injuries that lead them to go on murder rampages. First one to do it gets a Ryan Murphy show made about them. So, boo, 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 Jennifer Gardner shows up at her cheating boyfriend's dinner and she's like, our special today is the heart of a pig with its testicles ripped off and chopped up. And the wife is sitting there like, what's going on here? But, you know, obviously Patrick Dempsey is like, I am almost 
almost caught. It's a little anticlimactic if I'm being honest. Just so you know, the um, heart of the pig, a little something like this. She really thought she served just now by winding up that McDonald's toy in front of him. This is your big revenge scene, the culmination of woman to woman outrage that those nurses co-signed. This movie doesn't even try to be exciting. This wife who has also been lied to is just sitting there like, uh, is she gonna bring us any bread? The other tables all have a basket of bread. But she does that. She yells at him, doesn't even explicitly rat him out for his infidelity, just walks out. Nicely done. My son Franklin really loves your class. Charged these to my friend over there. Yeah, that's what I figured. So I put in some extra lobster tails and a cheesecake. <laughs> Thank you, Amos. This movie takes place in Los F***ing Angeles. How is it that everyone is on a first name basis with someone who works at every location they go to? It's not Stars Hollow from Gilmore Girls. Also, this poor guy had to give his lines in three seconds flat. He's like, that's what I figured. So I put some cheesecake and two extra lobster tails in there. Bye now. More restaurant stuff. I did think it was kind of funny how they make it seem so crowded in the Los Angeles restaurants. That I felt was very true to the city. It's a true New York too. Like you're at these expensive restaurants and you're at a tiny table with this much room between you and the next person over. It's like this time I went out to Merrick's in Los Angeles and I sat that close to Jay Leno right after he retired. And I was like, I can smell Jay Leno's shoulder meat right now. So they're at a restaurant. Blah, 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 blah. Blue, blue. Oh, after they land, Bradley Cooper is so nice to offer a ride to Julia Roberts. So they're great friends. Anne Hathaway takes a call and steps outside because she has a phone sex obligation and that gets her discovered. I moonlight as an adult phone entertainer. Moonlighting would imply that you don't also do it during the day at your office job using the company phone for some reason. Also, you know this dialogue was written by a 65 year old because nobody in their 20s would call their side gig moonlighting. We all grew up knowing Bruce Willis from The Sixth Sense. Topher Grace just can't handle this phone-based infidelity. A 100K student loan, I have absolutely no idea how I'm gonna pay off. I have no health insurance, so if you know of a job that will pay a poetry major more than $40 an hour with her clothes on, I'm all ears. Well, you could try writing some poetry, but apparently that aspect of your personality is less prominent than your racy, scandalous job title, which actually just involves talking on the phone. Topher Grace runs off. They go to the Forever Cemetery screening, Hector and him. Jessica Biel is at her party that no one showed up to, but then Jennifer Gardner shows up and is busting the pinata, so it's funny. There's an Indian wedding happening across from it. At the movies, Hector and Shirley MacLaine make up. You love someone, you love all of them. That's the job. I know that now. You gotta love everything about them. The things that you find lovable and the things that you don't find lovable. What was that line delivery? Well, things you find lovable and things you don't find lovable. Shirley MacLaine, you sound like you're in Shirley McPain. She is filling up some adult diapers there. <laughs> Why does the doorbell ring? So those two make up. Edison is talking to the little girl whose parents own this Indian restaurant where Jessica Biel's party is. These two suck. Oh, but I love Taylor Swift. I know Rainy likes you. Really? Well, I like her a lot too. She's the only other fifth grader who has Frank Zappa on her iPod and she loves giraffes. How is this kid both 45 years old and five years old, yet he's being played by an eight year old? Too many different ages. Also, I'll say it again. This little love addict has too much going on for a character who is still learning division of whole numbers. He misses his mom. He's in love with his teacher. He likes giraffes. Baby boy, I started hating you from the moment I learned your name was Edison. So all of this is just digging a deeper hole. Why don't you go invent the light bulb with your newsboy cap? P.S. He, so he like went up to Ashton Kutcher and was like, you didn't deliver my flowers. So he gives Edison that shiny box that he wasn't supposed to open till the end of the movie. Edison gives that flower to Jennifer Gardner, who it's revealed that's who he meant when he said the best girl at school. When all of these things get revealed, the dialogue makes no sense upon re-watching it. Like Edison is supposed to be like vague about who he's sending it to, so this reveal works. So he's like, I'm sending these flowers to the best girl at my school. Would you call your grown teacher the best girl? I hope not. And then the flower in the box is just like an orchid. It's not special or memorable in any way. So I'm like, this flower reveal was set up for nothing. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. I know I said it once, I'll say it again. I love the music of Taylor Swift. 
I used to be the damsel in distress. You took me by the hand and you picked me up at six. Today was a fairy tale. Taylor Swift and I have a whole lot in common. For example, our perfect date would start at 6 p.m. so that I can be in bed by nine watching Cake Boss. <gasps> so while that song plays, all the people are in love. Oh my God, oh my God. Ashton is not with his girl yet. You saw. Yeah. That's me. Bradley Cooper said, being gay means touching another man's head like it's a basketball, right? Well, I'm so brave for taking on this role. Yep, Bradley Cooper's character from The Plane also turned out to be gay. So this is the new Stonewall. It feels like the movie is trying to teach us a lesson by being like, why did you assume all these characters were straight? Hmm, I don't know, probably because the rest of this script left me wondering if the writer even knew that gay people existed at all. I'm pretty sure you had boy and girl trees getting married in a couple of these storylines. I hate, hate, hate this reveal that Bradley Cooper was never actually flirting with Julia Roberts. That was a misdirect to think they would be the ones who like ended up together. You kind of thought for a second like, oh, Bradley Cooper's gonna make his move and you know, stop her from marrying the wrong guy, but nope, gay. What does this mean for Sean Jackson? Will there be more house music played in the locker room? I stand behind you, Sean, metaphorically. Are you saying literally you cannot stand behind a gay person? Why, Jamie Foxx? Afraid your dick is gonna go up there? Because that's what you just said on the six o'clock news, mama. I heard it. <sighs> Topher Grace goes up and apologizes to Anne Hathaway. He also learned about unconditional love from watching the old people forgive each other at the cemetery. I mean, when you found out something about me you didn't like, you judged me and failed. I don't think that's a promising foundation for a relationship. Girl, what is your robe doing right now? Here's the thing, I don't even want a boyfriend that I have to teach lessons to about accepting me for who I am. They should be able to do that from the time that we meet, more or less. That's why I tell all of my prospective partners on the first date that I'm Spider-Man. And then I use their reaction to gauge how willing they'll be to go along with all the nonsense I say. Today was a fairy tale, chewing watercress, eating barley out inside a field. That's a song about cows. Grass-fed cows. Today was a fairy tale, moo. What's happening here? Topher and Jofer make up. Oh, I think he's like a little intimidated. He's like, my first thought was like, you wanted all this crazy sex stuff that I couldn't give you. I'm just a shrimpy nobody who can't please a woman. That's what he said. And she's like, good news. I love that. And for the record, this is what I like. Simple. Let's just keep it really simple. Yeah, let's not even wear condoms. Too complicated. I want you to pump your little ugly baby into me, Topher. <laughs> pump that ugly, ugly fetus inside me, pump it. So Jamie Foxx and Jessica Biel kiss in front of the green screen. I'm like, okay, these people only interacted for the first time two hours ago. So that doesn't feel really earned. Now we're just matching people up. You could also show people, especially Jessica Biel, who hated being single on Valentine's Day. You could also show that it's okay to be single on Valentine's Day as part of all of this. This, right? Whatever. Too complex. Boing. She's like, happy midnight on Valentine's Day. Uh, I have to get back on a plane to Iraq in 30 minutes, so bye. As it's revealed, Julia Roberts was not trying to make it home to a husband or boyfriend, but to her son. And Edison's mom was not dead, as we were supposed to assume. She was in the military. Once again, <laughs> It seems like Gary Marshall really wanted to use the war with Iraq to add some sentimentality to all of these movies because that was in New Year's Eve as well. So that's the third reveal that they were stringing us along with this whole time. She has a son. Again, who cares? That might be the end of the main story, but you know we have some bonus footage. Hey, I'm Taylor. I'm Taylor. Yeah, Taylor. it's confusing. Not as confusing as whatever this deleted scene was going to be. I think once they saw the final cut of those first two scenes with Taylor's acting, they were like, you know what? I think we've actually hit a natural stopping point for the romance between Felicia and Willie. A little bit goes a long way with those two. It seems like Gary Marshall was just using this bad, awful movie to remind us that in the past, he made one movie that was at the time well received with a similar Cast. And we're passing the famous Rodeo Drive. You ever shopped here? I did once actually. A big mistake. Big. 
huge. I think you're probably thinking about this movie. And just so you know, those fake headlights in the rear view window make it look like Julia Roberts is being hunted down by the hitcher. But that's all Cupid loaded into his bow and arrow for Valentine's Day of 2022. Did you enjoy this star-studded cast of holiday love hearts? Love hearts, what is that? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Also, what other Gary Marshall movies exist? Should we watch them? Also, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see even more clip breakdowns like this. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week, so hit that notification icon. That way you'll always be the first to know when I upload a brand new video and shoot you in the face like Cupid with an arrow. I hope you have an amazing Valentine's Day. I think you guys are all my Valentine because uh, you guys are all the greatest. Thank you so much for making a big mistake huge with me today. I will see you next time. <laughs>